If you take a look at the list of Ten Commandments that we have over here, which ones would you think are the most important ones? Oh, I know, you'd probably just say the religious thing and say they're all important, they're all equally important. They're all just as important, but the chances are there's one that you've despised, you've justified yourself in doing so. And if you looked up and down the list, you'd probably say, yeah, there is the one. one. One of those isn't so important. I've heard teaching on it. One of these we can get rid of. But if there's even just one that you're not obeying, then you must be ashamed before a holy God that gave us Ten Commandments, Psalm 119.6, then I would not be ashamed when I look into all your commandments. So we read the passage, Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. And so what we're going to look at, so, th so this sermon is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We're going to look at, so remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We're going to look at objections to keeping the Sabbath. We're going to look at reasons to keep the Sabbath, and we're going to look at how to keep the Sabbath. If it's important enough for God to put in his top 10 list of requirements, they're not optional. There's not a one on there that's optional for people who get into heaven. Not even one. Then it's worth for us to take a look at, and it's worth it for us to obey it. So, some, some people right now talking about this, you may have just checked out, and I feel sorry for you if you do because I can't help you and God cannot help you either because you're, unless your spiritual condition changes, you are in spiritual blindness, you will remain in spiritual blindness unless there's a change in attitude. The person who's in the worst condition today is the one that thinks they know a lot. They've immunized themselves to truth because they made themselves resistant to it. How? By give, by, by outside teachings. The one who says, I, I know my position on the Sabbath. I've listened to this person and this person. I know exactly what to think. And there's nothing that Dan could say that would change my mind. That is the person I weep for today because that is spiritual blindness. That is a person who comes to the house of the Lord with a hard heart, refusing to listen to whatever is spoken. I should be able to just read God's word and have everybody willingly obey it and say, and, 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 and just say, oh, yes, we'll do it. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We will. Show us how. Teach us how. I should be able to just point there and say, let's keep the Sabbath holy and hear a, a hearty round of amens. But if I tried that, I think I'd get a bunch of folded arms and quizzical looks. What do you mean? Uh, I have to? There's something expected of me? Hard hearts have a tool that is used to help them. That tool is a hammer. God's word is like a hammer, it says in Jeremiah, that crushes the rock into pieces. And that's the thing that needs to happen before we can even talk about how to, to do what the Lord has commanded us to do. So I have to cr crush rocks in pieces before I can preach the word, before good seed could be sown, so that, so that that seed might take root in a willing heart. God's word shouldn't need to be a hammer, but because of poor teaching and people grasping and holding on to that poor teaching, then it must be a hammer. To so many people today, we have to prove why we should comply. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to dispel every argument and so to, to, because otherwise the brakes will stay on in every person's heart and every person's mind. So, so, this is, so the objections, these are the hammers that we're going to deal with, each one of the objections, because your favorite Bible teachers don't hold to it. That's, it, that's the first objection. Because your favorite Bible teachers say that the fourth commandment isn't a commandment. Let me ask you a question. Has God installed a modern-day apostle, a pope of sorts 3,000 miles away to be the dispenser of all truth for Christendom? Because so many people treat him like they have, like God has. There's one channel of truth, and that channel is 3,000 miles to the west, and anything he says, we will obey. And anything that Dan says takes a second tier to Mr. Study Bible. Why do you weigh their words as being more valid truth? Why? 
Are they more than a man? Are they less of a sinner? Do they have a purer, cleaner heart? Because study skills won't get you there. I could take people from any Ivy League school and put the Bible in front of them and tell them to study, and they could come up with doctrines. But that doesn't mean those doctrines are right. The one Who is the one that God reveals truth to? He that's of a pure heart. God reveals his secrets to that one. So you've heard from the big boys. You've consulted the modern-day Ahithophel. Why, is, why do I need to listen to Dan at all? He can't have anything to say over the big boys. Oh, because you're a respecter of persons. The most dangerous place to be in church is to hear the preacher of your own church and discount the words. So many people think they're on solid ground because somebody 3,000 miles away said something, and you have no idea what sin is in his life. Has God tasked somebody 1,000 miles away to shepherd your soul? then why do you look to them for instruction and guidance? So many people would have no problem missing our Bible study, but they refuse to miss the Bible study online. To the handsome Absalom, who's new to the scene, The lust of the eyes draws people's heart to him, to the secret window into the, in, into the house of God out there in that city. And you count his words as double weight compared to the words here. Proverbs 6.25, don't lust in your heart after her beauty, nor let his or her eyelids allure you, for an adulteress will prey upon the precious life. God has seen it. And he's warning you, you're in a slippery place. Do you know that God has not ordained internet preachers to establish doctrine for another church? Did you know that? No, God installs a local man in the local church and entrusts the sheep to his care and equips the true shepherd for the work of the ministry, to, to, for the full work of the ministry needed by that church. Don't you know that God does not set up an apostolic pope 3,000 miles away to establish doctrine for the churches in America? No, Christ is the head of the church. Every local church, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the one head over us. There is no other head. And we receive whatever light he chooses to give us, and we give his message. And God doesn't send the same, send the same message to the church at Laodicea as he does to Smyrna. There are two different churches, two different cultures, two different needs, two different messages all under the banner of Christ. And he doesn't send the message from 3,000 miles away or 1,000 miles away to you because your problems are different. Someone who doesn't believe what is being taught at their own church is somebody who cannot be helped. They have their own belief system, their own group of online preachers refusing the form of doctrine that's delivered to them in their own church. They're not a recipient of the life of that church. They're a usurper of the spiritual life of others. They act as if they get it from that church, but they don't. What they have, they get from their online church, from their apostolic pope, who, who doesn't even know their name. From their own handsome Absalom through their secret window. They watch from outside, but they're not inside of that church. A hand that's a thousand miles away from the body is not part of the body. And you're not part of the body of Christ unless you're among the body of Christ. You cannot fellowship with people unless you gather together with them. And there's no fellowship with people unless you're partaker or believing of the same teachings. Why do you see others gaining spiritual life hear but refuse to partake of it. Those who hear the message and receive it find life. Look, you'll see it. Do you see others entering the narrow door but you yourself refuse to enter in? Jonathan Edwards said in Sinners of the, in the Hands of an Angry God, and now you have an extraordinary opportunity, a day wherein Christ has thrown the doors of mercy wide open and stands in, in calling and crying with a loud voice to poor sinners, a day wherein many are flocking to him and pressing into the kingdom of God, many are daily coming from the east, west, north, and south, 
Many that were very lately in some miserable condition that you are now in, but they are now in a happy state with their hearts filled with love to him who has loved them and washed them from their sins in his own, in his own blood, and they are rejoicing in hope of the glory of God. How awful is it, it is to be left behind in such a day, to see so many others feasting while you are pining and perishing, to see so many rejoicing and singing for joy of heart while you have cause to mourn for sorrow of heart. And to hell for vexation of spirit. How can one rest? How can you rest one moment in such a condition? Are not your souls as precious as the souls of the people at Suffolk, where they are flocking from day to day to Christ? How sad to be in the midst of an awakening, even a small awakening like this is, but to drink from polluted streams elsewhere. When will you submit to the lordship of Christ? Stop believing the apostolic pope. He's not the gateway of truth. You have not been entrusted to the care of an Absalom a thousand miles away. Stop the fake fellowship of online church. Gouge out the eye that stares at the screen in lust and cut off the hand that clicks those teachings. If you would have life, listen to the word of God. So objection number one, your favorite Bible teachers don't hold to it. They are not Christ's apostolic pope. They are not his messenger sent to you. They are not his shepherd over you. Objection number two, keeping the Sabbath is legalism. Those ones out there, they like to call Sabbath keepers legalists. Sabbatarians, and they go beyond that. They, they don't just say Sabbatarians because that doesn't sound harsh enough. They say strict Sabbatarians because that adjective is derogatory and it makes people shame to be part of, to, to be one of those that assume, that thinks the fourth commandment is binding. But the only person that would claim the Sabbath keeping as legalism is, is somebody who's rejected the law, rejected it. The word legalist isn't even in the Bible. Did you know that? I, I heard something about, don't worry, the, the danger is you might go into this, you know, or you might go into legalism. And, and, and it occurred to me, wow, it's not even in the Bible. Where, where does that danger come from? Take, look it up. Legalism, legalistic, not even in there. It's a genre that's made up to legalize antinomianism. Anti is against, and nom is law, anti -no against the law, antinomianism. And they use legalism whenever they're confronted with something that they don't want to do. They say, don't be legalistic. What they're really saying is, you're pursuing holiness and I don't want to, so don't do what you're doing. If action is ever, if, if the action of legalism, as you would think about it today, is ever seen in the Bible, it's seen with the Pharisees. And what their problem was is they taught man's, man's doctrine as though it were God's doctrine, and they added words to God's word. They added their words to God's word, and they canceled out God's traditions. Or they canceled, by their tradition, they canceled out God's teachings. That's what they did in Matthew 15. And in vain they worship me, teaching us doctrines and commandments of men. Matthew 23. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, and they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. In Matthew 15, 6, then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect. Jesus never condemned the Pharisees for obeying God's laws. He never did. Had, he obeyed, had they obeyed God's laws, he would have been delighted and overjoyed. No, he condemned them for replacing God's laws, for adding to God laws, God's laws, for nullifying God's laws. But the Lord dealt with this by going back to the scriptures and saying, haven't you read? Scripture is the final authority over man's tradition. He condemned them also for hypocrisy and outward observance of those law, but not from an inward heart. Matthew 23, 5, they do all their works to be seen by men in John 5, 42. But I know you, I know that you do not have the love of God in you. But Christ never condemned anybody for obeying God's laws or wanting to obey God's laws. He said, in fact, in Matthew 23, 23, you tithe mint and cumin, and these you ought to have done. He's saying to the Pharisees, you did right in tithing mint and cumin, but, you also, but you've left off the weightier matters of the law, such as love and justice. You should have done those also without neglecting the former. You should have done the tithing of even your smallest things, but not left off the more weighty things, Matthew 23, 20. But today, someone would have you think that if a person's eager to obey God, who's, who's zealous to live pleasing to God, then they'd label that person a legalist. They'd say, oh, there's danger of going into legalism. Really? What, is, what does that mean? Are they really saying you're in danger of adding to God's laws 
Because I have never met one person in my whole life who is in, in danger of adding to God's laws. But, um, but every single person who I've ever met in my whole life has discounted those laws. We're a long, long way from having legalists in the church today. Know that I've never seen a Pharisee type as Jesus portrayed them in, in today's church. But I've seen lots and lots and lots of antinomians who just take the law and throw it out. So what, what, so what they mean when they use the word legalism is they mean somebody who's earnest to obey God or anyone who thinks they can obtain spiritual benefit by obeying God's laws. And by that category, that's exactly what God wants. Those who use the term legalist are usually attacking those with sincere devotion to the Lord. And they build up their own position by tearing down those with the pure heart. They're the Ishmaels which persecute the Isaacs. It's, they're so foolish. They're promoting a God, of, a God who delights in rebellion, is what it would seem. God doesn't want your obedience. It means nothing to him. It, it, it doesn't? Well, well, gee, it looks to me like God killed 1.5 million Jews in the wilderness and only left two of them alive because of disobedience. I think God wants obedience. Those who keep the law contend with the wicked, Proverbs 28, 4. Obedience is exactly what God wants, sincere obedience to his word. And the poor in spirit who comes to him with a broken and obedient and contrite heart, that's the one that God receives. And he's told us the spiritual benefits of obedience. Psalm 119, the author of Psalm 119 himself is by the, by the, the definition that of, of the people would use as legalists today, the author of Psalm 119 himself was a legalist. Psalm 119.97, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Legalist. Psalm 119.165, Great peace have they which love thy law. Nothing shall offend them. Wait, wait, wait. You expect you're going to get benefit if you obey God? Legalist. No, no, no. That's exactly what it says. It says the benefit is great peace and nothing will offend you if you obey God's laws. That's exactly what it says. And by that, by that standard, Peter was a legalist also, Acts 5.32. And we are witnesses to these things and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Who are the ones who receive the Holy Spirit? Not Simon the sorcerer's but the ones who obey God. The Simon the Sorcerers, they can come and get dipped in water, but the Holy Spirit never comes upon them. He's given to those who obey him. God wants obedience. 1 Peter 1, 2, elect according to, full, to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification, sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience. Romans 6, 16, know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey his servants you are to whom you obey whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness your obedience leads to righteousness Romans 6 16 so is it legalism to keep the Sabbath no more than than it's than it's legalism to abstain from adultery those who advocate strict Sabbatarianism as legalism have to also stay with the exact same language that strict monogamy is the same branch of legalism, and that strict non-idolatry is also legalism, and that strict non-murdering is also legalism. 1 Corinthians 7, 1. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments of God is what matters. 1 Corinthians 7, 1. Have you ever heard that verse? Have you ever heard, outside of here, a preacher say, keeping the commandment of God is what matters. 1 Corinthians 7, 1, because that's what Paul said. And God loves those who keep his commandments. Exodus 20, verse 6, showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. In John 14, 15, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. You want peace and health and life? And you want a relationship with Christ, but you only keep nine out of 10, or eight, or seven, or six, or five, or four? You want Christ in your life and in your family, but you discount some of those? You don't obey the Lord Jesus? Well, why would he honor you? Why would he? 
The only way to have greater revelation from Christ is to obey, John 14, 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them is he who loves me. He says, I can see your heart, but I judge whether you love me based on your actions. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. And the only way to abide in Christ is to obey also, John 15, 10. If you keep my commandments, then you will abide in my love. Just as Jesus gives himself as an example, just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. You want to know how to abide in Christ? Obey him. So the objection, keeping the Sabbath is legalism. You can choose to be... A, if there's only two choices, legalism or antinomianism, then be an antinomianism and watch your life fall apart. Watch your family fall apart. Watch your job fall apart. Watch yourself get thrown in jail. Or you could obey God's rules, obey his laws, obey his commands. And whether somebody wants to call that legalism, let them. They have no clue what legalism is because it's not even a category discussed in the Bible. Next objection, every day is holy. I live in the Lord's Sabbath, therefore every day that I have is the Lord's Sabbath, and it's all holy. Hebrews 4, 3, he, we who have believed do enter the, that rest, as he said. He has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this wise, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. This is a scripture that people use and say, see, that's me. I've believed. I've entered into rest. That's the Sabbath. It says it right there in that scripture. Therefore, all I do is in the Sabbath rest. To keep every day holy is to keep no day holy. Because holy means set apart and different from the rest. Sanctified, devoted to God's purposes. So when you go to the store, was that trip devoted to God's purposes? Did God receive the benefit of that you going to the store? No, you did. That was devoted to your pur pur purposes. It was allowed by God, it's, but it's not for his purposes. It's for your own. When you go to work, is that for God's purposes? No, it's for your purpose so you could make money. God permits it, and that's fine, but it's not a holy purpose. It's not devoted to the Lord. When you, when you do your chores, your errands, or your work, are you mindfully meditating? Is your mind freed from the other thoughts all around you, from work and from chores and from projects, so that you could fully give yourself over to thinking God's thoughts, meditating on his word, prayer, pursuit of holiness, reading his teaching, seek, searching for the hidden things of God, applying your thinking to, to, to scriptural understanding? Or is your mind occupied with other stuff? Obviously, your mind's occupied with other things while you're at work or doing chores or whatnot. You can't meditate and process and learn and grow in the understanding of faith while you're putting a, you know, a project together. That's why we... And so to say every day is holy, all that says is there is no day that's holy. There is no day that's set apart for me to really think and meditate on God, to pursue him, to read his word, to do the things that he has asked me to do that glorify him. That's why we need a Sabbath day, to process, to learn, to grow in our understanding of the faith. And is it too much to ask that God, through whom we have life and breath and all things, that he expects a seventh back? Is that too much to ask? Is our life so full that we can't stuff God into a, a day? One day a week, he's saying, rest from your own works and sit at the feet of Christ and learn. If you had no Sabbath, then when would you read the, 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 the book of Scripture, the epistle that, that you wanted to read? When are you going to stuff that in over your lunch break? When, when will you read the Christian biography or doctrine or book that you've intended to read? Are you going to get up at 2 in the morning someday and do that? No, God gives you a whole day to do those things. What other day would you find time to go to the gathering together of the saints God commanded us to set apart the Sabbath day to make it holy. The next objection, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, and he canceled it. Oh, did he? Did, did he really? Some, some people say that he permitted things. 
He permitted things that were not lawful, thus redefining the Sabbath as a lower priority. Uh, it, really. Matthew 28, 20. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. That part is true. It's in a few other places. <clears throat> but Jesus said that because the Pharisees were imposing man-made rules. Jesus was telling them, you are not the Lord of the Sabbath. You didn't create it. You have no right to interpret it or to change it in its intention. Only the one who gave it can interpret it properly. And he was claiming divinity. The Lord of the Sabbath is the one who created the world and the, and the Sabbath. And the Lord of the Sabbath did not undo the Sabbath. Jesus was saying that he was Lord of the Sabbath. This intended to tell, tell the Pharisees, only I have the right to define what's allowed and what's not allowed. And so what did he do? What did he say about the Sabbath in Matthew 5, 17? Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass. But one jot or one tittle of the law, that right there, not one least stroke of a pen, that's what a, a, a tittle is, will be nullified or removed until all the law is fulfilled. In other words, the law will stay exactly like it is. Now, all the way through until everything is fulfilled, and that time is not now. The law is not undergoing a change with my ministry, Jesus is saying. It is staying exactly like it has always been with the Ten Commandments and not nine. And then Matthew 5:19 key verse for this. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. No, it doesn't look like Jesus nullified any of the Ten Commandments to me. It looks to me more like he nailed it in place to, to, and cemented it there, not to be removed as long as time exists. Why is it so? Why is he so harsh on people who break even one of the least of them and teach men to, commit, to, to do it so? Because you don't get into heaven if you don't follow those. And so by teaching people to not obey one of them, you have just discounted. You have just restricted the kingdom of God from people's lives. And so th that person will be called least in the kingdom of God, which is the, the visible church here, where there's tares and wheat, where there's four types of soil. And we don't even know if that person will get in, and they probably won't. The next objection, it's not a sign, it's a command, it's a command, it's not a command, it's a sign. This one takes mental gymnastics to get there, and I'm not even going to try to duplicate it. To take the command in the fourth commandment and move it from column A of commands and shift it over to column B of signs and then scratch out number four, but still call it the Ten Commandments, I do not know how you get there. But Mr. Study Bible does that. And it's not surprising. People get drunk on power. And some are foolish enough to believe that. Look, you would never, never, never come to that conclusion if you used the text alone. Somebody from the outside had to come and whisper that into your ear. Just like the serpent. Just like Eve never would have thought, hey, maybe I should eat from that tree, except for Satan and the serpent came and whispered in her ear. You would never conclude by reading God's word that the Sabbath was only a sign. Never. Matthew 5, 19, Whosoever shall break one of the least of these commandments and teach men so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So Exodus 31, 12, and 13, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, this, this, is where, this, this is part of their mental gymnastics, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbath you shall keep. It is for a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. And so it is a command. That's why it's in the list of Ten Commandments. And it's also, it's also a sign. K 
can't it be on in column A and column B? Is that is that not allowed to be in column A and column B? Is there a rule against that? No, it can be in both, and God has placed it in both. Verse 14. Exodus 20, 14, I think, you shall keep the Sabbath, therefore it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death, for who, whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Exodus 31, 14. It was a sign that would have, if broken, invoked the death penalty. Does that sound like only a sign? If No, because in order to break the fourth commandment, you're breaking, you're transgressing. What transgressing is, is to break, uh, is to go over a known boundary. God makes a boundary, and you choose to go over that boundary anyway. That's what invokes a death penalty. And that's what every one of those commands required for people who broke them. Ezekiel 20, 12, and 20, 20 is also where it mentions that it's a sign as well. The sign was so the Israelites would know, so the future gen generations would remember Exodus 31, 12 and 13, 13, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak also to the children of Israel saying, surely my Sabbath you shall keep. It is for a sign between me and you throughout your generations so that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. To show that God is the Lord who sanctifies us, we sanctify the Sabbath. That's the arrangement. Deuteronomy 5, 12, observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. <clears throat> so why was it a sign? Because it's the only one, only two, actually, of the outward of the Ten Commandments that there's an outward visible thing that you can see. All the rest, eight out of the ten, are prohibitions. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. And you can't verify a prohibition. The vir by virtue of the fact that they're being obeyed, you would not be able to tell. Because to obey them is to not do certain things, and therefore it cannot be used as a sign. And it cannot be seen by an outsider. You can't see whether someone has not made another image of God or not worshipped an idol or not coveted in their heart or not stolen. You can't see those things. But you can see when someone takes a Sabbath day rest. Only number four and number five can be seen by those inside or outside the faith. The rest of them are invisible, cannot be used as a sign. So is it a sign and not a command? Let me state this the most clearly as possible. Only a fool would say so, that it's a sign only. It is a command. It invoked the death penalty. And Jesus said, whosoever breaks and teaches other men to break one of the least of these will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Leave it in column A and in column B. It is a command and it is a sign. The next objection. The Sabbath is not addressed at the Jerusalem Council. The Jerusalem Council in, in Acts 15 didn't say, you got to tell them, remember to keep the Sabbath. It also didn't say, you got to tell them to don't murder. It doesn't say that either. There's a lot of things the Jerusalem Council didn't say. It also didn't say, remember to tell them, don't have any other gods, and don't use God's name in vain, and honor your mother and father, and don't covet. It didn't say any of those things. Does God give a pass on the rest of those things? No, they're just as binding. All the rest are just as binding on Gentile believers, even though they're not specifically mentioned at the Jerusalem Council. The discussion at the Jerusalem Council was about this. Why are you trying to load the Gentile believers with things that we were not able to bear and our fathers were not able to bear? What is it that Peter was not able to bear? Was he not able to bear obeying the Sabbath? Was that such a high thing that he couldn't do it? No, the ceremonial law is what Peter wasn't able to bear. Nobody was able to bear. That's what Peter was talking about, not the moral law. Acts 15 does nothing against the moral law. In fact, it does the opposite. It, it, it nails it in place. So the Jerusalem Council had two contributions. Would you turn there to Acts 15 with me, please? <clears throat> Acts 15 in verse nine, 19 therefore I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God 
but that we write to them to abstain, four things, to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. What he's saying is the f some of the main things that the Gentiles are known for tripping over, drinking blood, eating things strangled, idolatry and sexual immorality, those are the big ticket items that are just known for the Gentiles doing. Let's cut those off at the pass. The rest will be fixed when they go to synagogue and read about Moses. Moses has throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues on every Sabbath because the people from the synagogue were Christians also. Some of the, That's where Paul went first to get his first group of Christians to the synagogue, and they came and they knew the law. And when the church got together, there was somebody or people there who knew the law, and they would teach the Old Testament, which was created for our understanding. So the Jerusalem Council had two contributions the, the first significant contribution that the Gentiles don't have to follow Jewish ceremonial and civil laws, and the second is the Jerusalem Council addressed the major and normal practices of the life of pagans, and I guess the third thing is it, um, it points them to the, the scriptures that are already in every town to figure the rest out. They realize more still has to be dealt with. That's why they said, Moses will fix that. When they read Moses, when they read the law in every synagogue, that's when those things will get fixed. And so to hear Moses' law, it was read in every synagogue, and that would, there's, there, he's saying, there's no need for, me, need for me to regurgitate everything that Moses wrote here. We'll just hit the big ticket items and then point them to the scriptures. The, the, the Ten Commandments are not grievous or burdensome, the New Testament says. Let me remind you, the same Paul who got his way in this Jerusalem council also in, said in Romans 3.31, do, do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. And in 1 Corinthians 7.19, like we read earlier, circumcision is nothing, uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments of God is what matters. The same Paul that got his way at the Jerusalem council said, keeping the commandments of God is what matters, and we establish the law. Now, we don't throw out the Ten Commandments. We don't even reduce them by one, lest we ourselves be called least in the kingdom of heaven, and there be some that don't make it into, in, into heaven. When we come to faith, we see how beautiful God's laws are. That we have safety and peace and abiding in them. We have his presence dwelling with us as long as we do so. And we dare not turn away from following them. The next objection is an argument from silence. Some people say, this is the only commandment that's not reiterated in the New Testament. Oh, an argument from silence. That wouldn't work in a court of law. Why would you think it works in God's economy? If you were in court for murder and the judge, and you wouldn't say, Judge, the sign on the door didn't say that I couldn't kill people inside the store. The judge would say, The rules of law still apply everywhere, no matter where you are. An argument of silence is an extremely foolish position to stand upon. Their argument is, if it was so important to the, to the New Testament for the New Testament believer, then God would have put it somewhere in the New Testament. So here's my question. Does God have to say something twice for it to count? Does, does, does he really? Isn't, if you find something once in the scripture, is that not good enough for you? Or maybe you're one of those people that only listens to stuff that's in the right one, one quarter of the book, but you won't listen to anything else in the book. You, you throw the whole Old Testament away. What, hey, what if none, let's, let's take it further. Let's just pretend that none of the Ten Commandments were, were talked about in the New Testament. Does that mean we could throw those away also? Would it make the other nine non-binding and nullify them if we didn't happen to find them in the New Testament? Based on that argument, the only thing that makes a command binding in the Bible is whether it's found in the New Testament. And based on that argument, you have no other option but to throw away everything to the left of Matthew. If it has to be written from Matthew onward, then you have no use for anything prior to Matthew. Throw it away. 
And if, see, if so be that God did not happen to include a duplicate of command for adultery, would that make adultery acceptable as well? True? No, God gave the Old Testament for our instruction. All scripture, not all scripture minus this one verse, but all scripture is given for inspiration and is useful, profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. 1 Corinthians 11, 10, 11. Now all these things happen to them as examples as they were written for our admonition on whom the ends of the ages have come. Do not stand on an argument of silence. That's a, that's a fool's folly. If you're going to use an argument of silence to negate the fourth commandment, that's, that's foolish. Did God ever negate it? We, if you want to use it to, an argument of silence to negate the fourth commandment, then I'll ask you this. Why is it, can we not use an argument of silence um, for imposing it? God never said, I'm changing the fourth commandment. He never said that either. Do you find anywhere in the New Testament that says, I hereby cancel the fourth commandment? Because your argument of silence, I could use for the exact same opposite position. That God never, he's silent on nullifying it which means it remains intact. You say he's silent, therefore it remains to be, t then it gets taken away. I say he's silent, so it remains intact. It's, unadul it's unadulterated, it's untouched. But I can even go beyond that, and I can point to Matthew 5 and say Jesus commanded all 10 to be kept. So, using an argument of silence is like telling God, is like God saying, you got me, that's not what I meant for crying out loud. That was a remnant. That was a sign. Come on, guys. Why are you taking this so literally? Look, you can just do any old thing you want to do on my holy day. I'm fine with that. In Bible study, context is king. And once you understand the context, all of these pieces fall right into place. Would you please turn with me to Colossians 2? <clears throat> So in the New Testament, there's arguments made in the context of Jews versus Gentiles. That was the big thing that was happening back then. Whether Jews should keep the Sabbath day or whether Gentiles should feel constrained to keep the Sabbath day. So one online source, his name is Nick uh, Babile, he had some good perspective on this. False apostles crept into the church and they wanted to bring back the bondage of the ceremonial laws back into the church. They wanted the church to go back to the seventh day Jewish Sabbath and not on the first day of the week, the Sunday Christian Sabbath. We'll see some scriptures in a minute that show that the disciples gathered on the first day of the week. We have four different scriptures that prove that, each one. They, when, did, when did they gather? To, it was on the Lord's day, the first day of the week. They did many things, but it was always like their gathering, their reading, their teaching was on the first day of the week. It was not on the Jewish Sabbath. So the, so the Jewish Sabbath people, people the Seventh-day people, wanted to come in, and they, and they were saying, look, we don't think that you should be doing this on Sunday. We think we should move it to Monday. Context is king. Colossians 2.16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy, holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. This is to the Gentile believers who are being compelled to observe Jewish holy days. He's saying, let nobody judge you for gathering together on Sunday. Don't let them tell you that you have to gather on Saturday instead. It's fine if the Jews want to gather on, on the seventh day, that's fine. But to the Gentile believers, don't give in to their seventh day thing. Stick with your first day, first day Lord's Day, Sabbath rest. Let no man judge you in meter and drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. You have your own Sabbath on the first day of the week. Don't let them push you into trying to do it on Saturday. And, to, and the next one is Galatians 4.10. Would you turn there with me, please? Just a couple pages to the left. Galatians 4.10. <clears throat> this is to Gentile believers who actually succumbed to observing the Jewish holy days as part of their salvation. They gave in and they said, well, they told us we're supposed to, yeah, we're supposed to gather on Saturday instead of Sunday, so I guess we'll do it. And they started doing and we're supposed to just do Jewish stuff, so we're doing all the Jewish stuff. And Paul says in Galatians 4.10, 
You observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. He's saying, you're, you're doing all the Jewish stuff. You're not sticking with the Monday, Lord's Day, Sabbath rest. I'm afraid that you may not even be brought to Christ in the end. That the labor I've put upon you, that I've labored upon you, may be in complete vain that you, that all of you would be lost because you're giving in. You've succumbed to those that are pushing for the Jewish Sabbath and holy days. And then the next one is in Romans 14.5. Would you turn there, please? Romans 14.5. And in Rome, Paul's dealing with a group of people. Some are Jews and some are Gentiles. A mixed Christian, a mixed Christian church of both kinds. And we saw problems in, with that in chapters 1 and 2 as we studied through them a few months back. And now we see Paul addressing it again in chapter 14 and 5. What he's doing to this mixed group of believers, he's telling each group how to live in harmony with one another and how for each group to be persuaded in their own position. He's saying it's okay if the Jewish believers want to gather together on Saturday, but the Gentile believers need to continue to gather together on their Sunday just like normal to not be pushed into anything else. Romans 14, 5. One man esteems every day above another. That's the Jewish Sabbath, or one day above another, the Jewish Sabbath. They're saying, the Jewish Sabbath is more important than the, than the Christian. He's saying, this is above the other ones. And another esteems every day alike. That's the Gentiles saying, uh, this, the, the seventh is the same as the other days. The Gentile believers saying, no, we're not going to, Abide by your Jewish Sabbath, Jewish seventh day rest. We're not going to do that. He's, he does not regard the Sabbath day, of the seventh Sabbath day, seventh day, the seventh. To the Lord, he does not regard it. He that eats, eats things that are forbidden by Jewish ceremonial law, eats to the Lord, and he, give, he gives God thanks. He that does not eat, that does not eat things that are forbidden by Jewish ceremonial law, he does not eat and gives God thanks. Paul's saying, look, the seventh day people, you can do your seventh day stuff. The non-eaters who are abiding by Jewish ceremonial laws, you can continue to do that. But the Gentiles, eat whatever you want. You don't have to abide by their rules. And don't feel compelled to go and abide by their seventh day rest. You stick with the first day rest, the Lord's day. Once each one of these are understood in context, then, then it becomes clear. We cannot impose our own context onto the scripture and walk away with an accurate understanding. It, it, it is faulty. Matthew Henry says, those who thought themselves still under some kind of obligation by the ceremonial law esteemed one day above another, and they kept up a respect to the times of the Passover, Pentecost, New Moons, and Feast of Tabernacles. But those who knew that all these things were abolished by Christ's coming, the Gentile believers, they esteemed every day alike. We must understand that with the exception of the Lord's Day, this we must understand this with the exception of the Lord's Day, which all Christians unanimously observed. So the ceremonial laws were nailed to the cross, while the moral law of the Sabbath still continues in observance to the day. Ephesians 2.15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of two into one man, so making peace. And the next reason to keep the Sabbath, is because Christ commanded it. And we read Matthew 5, 19. Whosoever breaks one of the least of these commands will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever does and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And these, those who break will be called least because they've brought men to ruin. They've robbed men of peace because peace comes with obeying God's laws. They choose the wisdom of man over the wisdom of God, and people were lost to hell for it. If John Bunyan were alive today, the Holy Spirit would have nothing to convict him of. He was convicted of the sin of Sabbath breaking. That is what led to his conversion. He was out on the green on Sunday playing ball. I can't remember. It's called cat something, cat's eye or cat's tail. And the Lord spoke to his heart and said, how long will you continue in your sin? And he understood that to be Sabbath breaking. And that's what turned him to the Lord. There would be people saved if the fourth commandment was preached. 
but instead it's nullified, almost crossed America. There would have been people in heaven if they had been convicted of Sabbath breaking just like John Bunyan. But under the preaching of today, John Bunyan would have been lost. There will be people lost without the fourth commandment. They don't even know that they're displeasing to God. They've been told they're righteous and holy when they're not. And so many preachers and teachers cancel out the fourth commandment and they bring themselves under condemnation for doing it. How is it that you could cancel out one of God's Ten Commandments and think that God will excuse it? How many books are in the bookstore with your name on them, sir? How many study Bibles have your name? You're the teacher of Israel. You've been teaching America and the world for over 50 years, and most churches have based their practices on what you have said. There are greater con- there's greater condemnation for leaders. If Nehemiah were alive today, he might pull your hair out, and rightly so. Don't act so surprised about the state of America, sir. You made it happen. It was on your watch. You are the teacher of Israel with hundreds of thousands of study Bibles with your name on them that told people that the fourth commandment is not required. Why is America allowed stores to be open on Sundays? Sir, because you told them it was okay. And then after that, there's an avalanche of effects that happen. Why is alcohol sold on Sundays? Natural progression of when the dam starts to break. Why have communities scheduled sports on Sunday mornings on top of church? Because the leaders told them that they could. Because you, sir, told them that the Sabbath was not required. Why does soccer compete and win over church on Sunday mornings? Why are families broken apart and not together on Sunday mornings in church? Because church leaders have taught, because you, sir, have taught that the fourth commandment is not a commandment, but only a sign. You have nullified it. But you say, Calvin bowled on Sundays. Oh, okay, I see the problem. You worship Calvin. We don't. We worship Christ the Lord and we follow him. Take your eyes off of Calvin and look to Christ and you'll find salvation there too. Leave him. Even if he's your closest kin, that is the requirement of Christ. Even if your mother, father, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, dog, or even Calvin himself If you won't forsake him, then you are not worthy of me, is what Jesus essentially said. We're a Bible church. What does that mean? It means our only allegiance is to the Bible, not to Calvin, not to a Reformed theology, only to the Bible itself. We're willing to to walk with others as far as they're willing to walk according to the Bible, and wherever they choose to stop, as on their progression to get to the highway of holiness, we leave them behind us, and we continue, whether that's at Calvin or at Martin Luther or anybody else, and we continue on to, the, to walk the highway of holiness alone if need be. And if we followed Calvin like the Calvinites do, then we would also bowl on Sundays. We would also do all the, all the things that Calvin did, which, by the way, did include assenting to murder. You want to be a Calvinist? That's where it will lead to. That's where it led Calvin to. He assented to murder of somebody for their beliefs. That's the end of the fruit of Calvin. Follow him if you want. But here we are a Bible church. We will follow the Lord Jesus Christ, not Calvin. I have yet to find a Calvinist who isn't confused about the scriptures. Every single one of them wrongly divides the word of truth. Don't look so startled, sir. Wipe the, wipe the surprise expression off your face about the state of America, Mr. Study Bible. You taught them to do this. You've told them there's only nine, and the foolish lower pastors have believed you. And then they, and then they said, well, if, if there's only nine, why can't I break another one too? And they all went to one to break, and it's their favorite one to break number seven. And that's why the church is in its state that it is today. All, after all, if, if, if one of them is not steadfastly nailed, then none of them are steadfastly nailed in place. So this generation of church leaders failed on their watch. They thought they were smarter than God's book. They called the fourth command optional. And, and now we're, we're realizing in society that they're not smarter than God's book. 
I'd rather have my name on nothing than have my name on something that cancels the fourth commandment. You cry foul at the government now, but you don't realize you're the one who started it. You will give account to God for teaching rebellion. I cannot imagine the arrogance that it takes to come and cancel a commandment of God. And in his own house, using his own word from his own pulpit, using his own book to cancel out his own command. God primarily blames the leaders for a nation's waywardness, the princes, prophets, and priests, and kings, because the people look up to them. Nehemiah 9.34, you can see that. They have not kept your law, nor heeded your commandments and your testimonies. <clears throat> Psalm 119, but I will delight myself in your commandments, which I love. Yes, your commandments are better than gold. More, yes, more than, yeah, more than fine gold. One, Psalm 119, 127. And, and next, why will we obey the, the, the keep the, the Sabbath? Because spiritual awakening demands it. To the law and to the testimony. That's the, te that's the injunction, the prophetic injunction, Isaiah 8.20. To the law and to the testimony, it says, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. All revivals, all spiritual awakenings point to God's law and God's testimony, the rest of his scriptures. Every biblical revival is linked to a return to the law. Do you want to know what God wants us to do? He's already told us it's in his law. It shows us where we're in error and our need to repent. That's why to the law and to the testimony, that's where we have to start. Repenting, they repented from their evil ways and obeyed the things that they used to think were okay <clears throat> to, to do or to not do. So if you want revival in your heart, then you have to go back to the law and to the testimony. Are you in spiritual darkness? Go to the law and you'll find out where your disobedience lies. God cannot, will not bless disobedience. He will not bring that person into spiritual light. To do so would destroy his character. But I'm really not doing bad things, you say. The fourth commandment penalty was death. You don't think it's a bad thing. God thinks it's worthy of death. James 2.10, whoever shall keep the whole law yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he said, he said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not kill. Now, if you do not commit adultery, yet if you kill, you become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. James is pointing specifically to the Ten Commandments and saying, if you break one, then you're a transgressor. You've, you've broken the whole law. You will be judged by the law of liberty, says James in 2.12. That is how you'll be judged. Did you keep that law? And remember, the pastors that are now telling you not to keep the Sabbath are the very ones who failed under their watch. America's in the times it is because of them being at the helm. The church is the conscience of America. And so for 50 years, they've been telling people, you don't have to obey the Sabbath. And look at where it's left your family. Look at where it's left the church. <clears throat> look at where it's left the nation. So where, where has it left the church? Those evangelicals that took the bait that, that, that the fourth commandment is optional? Where has it left the church? The services have to be scheduled around soccer because people won't go because soccer is happening, and soccer is more important than church. People won't go and give their money unless you give them an alternate time, Saturday night or Sunday earlier, or online option. And then 70% of the kids fall away from the faith. They say, we can be spiritual on our own. We can worship in nature. We can worship while we're working on the car. And where, where's this left? The, the church in America, Ten Commandments off of the schools, off of the courts, off of the public buildings. And where has it left the family? Where has Sabbath breaking left your family? Nobody thinks they need to go to church. They're strewn about on Sunday mornings, slipping in, soccer, video games. That's what the average church family looks like these days. Do you know what foolishness is? It's doing the same thing, expecting a different result. You got the result of breaking the Sabbath. 
And if you keep doing it, you'll keep getting the same result. A fool goes back to their folly. A wise person listens to rebuke. They listen to instruction and correction, and they make corrections. If you want what you've got, then keep doing what you're doing, and you'll continue to get it. If you want what God has planned, then keep the fourth commandment. And then look, so look at where the average church family is these days. But then look at where those strict Sabbatarians are, those who uphold the Sabbath, those Puritans, those legalists, those Mennonite and Amish, those strict Sabbatarians. Look at their families. Where are they? Well, they're banded together. They're at church on Sunday morning and at Sunday night. Are you happy about the state of America? It started out with nullifying the fourth commandment. Are you happy about the state of the church? It started out with nullifying the fourth commandment. Are you happy with your family? Blame it on the fourth commandment. If you don't love God and keep his ways, then why would he keep his covenant with you and your family? Deuteronomy 7, 9. Therefore know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. So how will we win our families back? What will God use to convict them that church going is required? How will they get there if they see your life and my life showing that it's optional? As long as your Sabbath day looks no different than your neighbor's, then the Holy Spirit has no, nothing to work with. Your Sunday has to look like God requires, and then the Holy Spirit will have something to work with. Then he can use that as a lever in the lives of those around you. How can he bless your representation of, of, of him when you're in disobedience to him? And all those fundamental Baptists, those holiness churches, those foolish zealots who kept the fourth commandment, well, they're all still in church, and their kids are serving by their side. Those who despise the command will be lightly esteemed, but he who honors me, is what God says, who keeps my command, him I will honor. The next reason to keep it is because the apostles and disciples kept it. The disciples. Was there anybody else who understood Jesus' teachings better than the apostles? And no, they understood Christ's interpretation of the Sabbath better than anybody. And you know what they did when the, when the body of the Lord Jesus Christ was in the tomb over a Sabbath day? They didn't even go to anoint it, which is normally done as soon as death, as, as near after death as possible. Nope, they waited, they obeyed the Sabbath. They didn't even go see Jesus. Not even this, not even Christ in the tomb, his body needing to be anointed, trumped God's command to sanctify the Sabbath and keep it holy. That's what the actions of the people who knew Christ the best showed. Not even anointing the body of the Messiah trumped the Sabbath day. <clears throat> and, and you think soccer does? And bike riding? And home repair? Oh, fool. Oh, no. They didn't even go to anoint Jesus' body. They understood his teachings, and they stayed put. They did nothing about it. That was in obedience to Jesus' teaching on the Sabbath, Matthew 28, 1. And the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And not even Jesus broke the Sabbath. Was, when he was in the tomb, he stayed there. Why? Because it was the Sabbath day. Mark 16, 9. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. Even Jesus didn't go do other things on the Sabbath day. It was instituted at creation is the next one. <clears throat> People think that, Mo, that, that Moses instituted it. No, the verse we read in Exodus 20 points that it's instituted for all of mankind because God instituted at creation. In the New Testament, we do see it shift to the day we, we, the we hold our assemblies. Our Sabbath day is on Sunday, and that's in Mark 16, 9. 
And we just read that. Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared to Mary Magdalene, the first day of the week. John 20, verse 19. Then it's the same day evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be unto you. On the first day of the week, that's when they were gathered together and when Christ showed up. And in Acts 20, verse 7. Upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached to them. The first day of the week... They came together to break bread, and Paul preached. Acts 20, verse 7, that's probably the, hard, the hardest one that we've got that, that shows the Sunday gathering. In 1 Corinthians 16, 2, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So they took the gathering on the first day of the week. And then the next reason is because it's the testimony of the saints. Spurgeon said, <clears throat> about keeping the Lord's day. The Sabbath is to be sanctified by a holy resting all that day, even from such worldly employments and recreations as are lawful on other days, and spending the whole time in public and private exercises of God's worship, except so much as is taken up in the works of necessity and mercy. John Bunyan, this is what he has to say about it. Have a special care to sanctify the Lord's day, for as you keep it, so it will be with you all week long. Make the Lord's day the market for your soul. Let the whole day be spent in prayer, repetitions, or meditations. Lay aside the affairs of the other part of the week. Let the sermon that you have heard be converted into prayer. Shall God allow you six days, and will you not afford him one? In the church, be careful to serve God, for you are in his eyes and not in man's eyes. Arthur Pink, this is what he says, the lasting nature or perpetuity of this twofold commandment is further evidenced by the fact that in the above reason, given for its enforcement, there was nothing which was pertinent to the nation of Israel, but instead that which speaks with clear, a clear voice to the whole human race. This statute was given a place not in the ceremonial law of Israel, which was to be done away with when Christ fulfilled its types, but in the moral law, which was written by the finger of God himself upon tables of stone to signify to us its permanent nature. Thomas Watson, the Puritan writer, 1600, said, The thing I would have you now observe is that the commandment of keeping the Sabbath was not abrogated with the ceremonial law, but is purely moral, and the ob observation of it is to be continued to the end of the world. Charles Hodge, a theologian in the 1800s, it is a strong argument in favor of this conclusion that the law of the Sabbath was taken up and incorporated in the, uh, by the apostles and the infallible founders of the Christian church. All the Mosaic laws founded on permanent relations of men, either to God or to their fellows, are in like manner adopted in the Christian code. The church fathers and those who were the disciples and the apostles of the early Christians would also also hold to keeping of the Sabbath. Ignatius, let everyone that loves Christ keep the holy, the, the holy, keep holy the Lord's day, the Queen of Days, the Resurrection Day, the highest of all days. Irenaeus, Bishop of Lyons, <clears throat> on the Lord's day, he said, every one of us Christians keeps the Sabbath. And Clement of Alexandria says, a Christian, according to the command of the gospel, observes the Lord's day, therefore glorifying the resurrection of the Lord. It wasn't until dispensationalism landed through Darby and through the Schofield Study Bible in the late 1800s that did, did, did the thought even creep into Christendom to change or to nullify uh, observance of Sunday as, as the day of the Lord. It didn't even come as a thought until the Schofield Study Bible in the late 1800s. And then it wasn't pushed out widespread until Dallas Seminary in the 1950s became popular and started pushing out people to go start Bible churches, which they call Bible churches, but they should really just call them dispensational churches. And that's when the decline in America, American religion began in about the mid-1950s when Dallas Seminary pushed out all their theologians, or all their, all their preachers. And look at the result. We're living in it today. Jeremiah 6, 16, thus says the Lord, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it, and then you will find rest for your souls. But in Jeremiah's time, it can, the verse continues, it says, but they said, we will not walk in it. Most won't walk in it, but I'm hoping that we will. So how to keep the Sabbath holy? All of that was breaking the rocks with a hammer that I shouldn't even have to use. We should be able to look and say, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Okay, Lord, yes, I will. What do you want me to do? I'll do it. And I hope we're there right now. So 
do certain things and don't do other certain things, things not to do. Don't work to make money on the Lord's Day. I know there's a few jobs where people do that, and they'd probably be best to get out of that line of work. And regardless, uh, there's one in maybe 500 people who that applies to, and we, if that's you, we can talk afterwards. Jeremiah 17, 19 through 27 is a scripture on that, and also Nehemiah 13, 15 through 22, where Nehemiah closes down the gate. He says, why are you doing what you're not supposed to be doing with buying and selling and trading on the Sabbath day? Shut down the gate. Don't let anybody in with their wares to buy and sell and trade. And after the Sabbath, then you can open it up again. <clears throat> so <clears throat> don't buy, sell, trade, or work to make money on the Lord's Day. Don't do your own pleasure on the Lord's Day. Isaiah 56, 6. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your own pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath of delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. So let it be a day in which you do the Lord's pleasure. Speaking the Lord's words, listening to the Lord's words being spoken. The Lord wants your attention for the day. Let him have it. Give it to him. Listen to his word. Read it. Teach his word. Meditate on it. Meditate on him. Don't make it about what you want to do. Make it about what he wants you to do. <clears throat> That's Isaiah 56, 6. Do not make it about the family. Include the family, but it's not about the family. You don't see anything on there about the family. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It doesn't say remember the Sabbath day to make it family. It's holy, given to the Lord completely. It's about the Savior, the Lord. It's the Lord's day. It's not the family day. You have six days for family, one day for the Lord. Whatever you choose to do with it, include the family as much as possible. But don't let it be about the family. It was not given for that purpose. Do not choose for it to be a burden. A hardened heart grumbles even at good things. Man in the wilderness that tasted like honey is despised and hated because of hardness of heart, because of an unfaithful heart. Unfaithfulness always wants something different. That's the trade of the trademark of unfaithfulness. It does it in likes and desires. It does it in it does it in every, it does it with churches, it does it with marriage, it does it with everything. Unfaithfulness is a, is a not spirit, not Holy Spirit character trait that permeates all of life for those who have it. Do not complain about what you can't have or what you can't do. Be thankful for what the Lord has given you. He's given you a day to pursue him and get to know him better, to delight yourself in him. So those are some things to don't do. What are some things to do? Make it holy, separated, different, set apart for the Lord's use as holiness to the Lord. Do whatever and say, Lord, what do you want me to do today? That I'll do. I don't want to please you. If I could just be in your presence today, that would be more than enough. Use it to refresh from last week and spiritually prepare for the coming week. The whole idea of rest that we read in Exodus 20 is that you do need rest. God didn't, but he gave the, the Sabbath rest to us because he knows we do. And so refresh from the last week. Catch up on your sleep. Do that. Spirits will prepare for the coming week. Don't go into Monday exhausted and tired because you stayed up all night. No, that's not honoring what the Lord gave it to you for. Those don't need or want this time to be in the Lord's presence, They've, because those who don't need or want this time to be in the Lord's presence, the reason why is because they've gotten comfortable in this world. They don't need time with the Savior because the world fulfills them. But the pilgrim and the sojourner needs time with the Lord to, to, to get to know him better. Next, assemble together as the early church did on Sundays. Don't forsake assembling together of the saints. Come to church in the morning and don't let it stop there. Spurgeon talks about people that come to church in the morning and they say, that's enough, I don't need any more. Will I see you tonight? Nope, I've had my fill for today. Come to night church also if you're able. How can you refuse the benefit and blessing that's available from the Lord's hand? At work, what would you think of a worker who refused continuous training, who refused to grow and learn more, who refused the extra classes or refused the training that would help them to be more productive? Would they be rewarded or discarded? Well, God feels the same way. If your day belongs to the Lord, then you have no rights or ownership in it. And he's prepared here in this church gatherings and events that are spiritually enriching, that are pleasing to the Lord. Will he say, 
He says, my oxen and my fatlings are killed. My servants have made everything ready. Come to the feast. And so many of those that are invited wouldn't come. Would the Lord say that about you? My oxen and my fatlings are prepared. My servants have spent hours preparing to make sure that there's good spiritual food for you to have. Come, come. And will you stay at home? Will he come to you and say, good job, I'm so proud of you that you've neglected the meal that I've prepared? Or will, or will he say, why didn't you go? I made it available, and you chose to watch TV instead. No, I'm not, I'm, I'm not proud of you. Enjoy the day. Delight yourself in the Lord on the Lord's day. Make it an oasis of rest, a joy, a blessing in your home and heart. A thankful heart will rejoice in what's received. Make it important to you. Make it the high water mark of your week. What other day do you have that's given to you by the Lord? Strip your heart and emotions, or set your heart and emotions on, on, on that day to, to say, that's when I can spend the time with the Lord that I really want to. Give your heart to him. Do ta you can do tasks that are necessary for yourself, Matthew 12. Jesus, Jesus' disciples picked corn, they picked grain, and they, and they rubbed in their hands and ate it. That's fine. Prepare meals for, for yourself. Do, do good for others. We see examples of that where Jesus healed in Matthew 12. Save lives, Luke 6, 19. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it, Jesus said. So save life. Teach God's word, Luke 4, 31. Jesus and people came down from Capernaum and Jesus taught them on the Sabbath days to read read God's word, Mark 3, 4. And he said to them, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or to do evil? But they, Oh, that's a different one. But to read God's word, uh, to hear God's word, Acts 13, 14. When they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down to hear and to interact, to hear God's word, prayer, Acts 16, 13. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was want to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted there. Do fellowship and breaking of bread together, break bread together, which we'll do here shortly. The early church did that in Acts 2.42, fellowship, breaking of bread, prayer, and, and, the, and the doctrine of the church, church teaching. During the week, everyone's so busy with tasks that you can't do, to get together, you can't do the things that you want. So now it's time to, to appreciate the presence of those who are also in Christ. Their time is as valuable as your time is, and they're making themselves available and giving that time to you, as busy as they are. And their wisdom is being made available to you without cost for free. Where else can you get godly counsel at such a cheap price? Be thankful for one another. I've never known somebody who's thankful for another, who loves another, who doesn't spend time with that person. Those who can't make time for another are those who do not have love in their heart for the other. Do fellowship in holiness, not in lust, not in complaining, not in, not in mirth, but in hearty counsel and joy and rejoicing in Christ, hearing about what he's done. Include everyone. Don't leave people out. Don't hide get-togethers from one another. That's a deceitful heart. Invite people. Be open and honest. If people do that to you, it hurts your feelings, so don't do that to them. Help one another. Give hearty counsel and good advice. Pray for one another. Give to God's work. We saw that. Re receive Christ's gracious blessing. Supersion says, most of Jesus' miracles were done on the Sabbath. Our divine master healed every day of the week. From the first even to the close of the seventh, he went about doing good and healing all manner of disease. Still, it's worthy of notice that the Lord Jesus frequently made the Sabbath to be a high day of grace and blessing. Six notable miracles where the Lord healed on the Sabbath. Casting out a devil in the synagogue, healing of a man whose hand was withered, lifting up of a woman who was bound by infirmity for 18 years, instantaneous cure of the dread disease of dropsy, the recovering of a man who had been afflicted with palsy for 38 years, the opening of the eyes of the blind, six notable miracles on the Sabbath day to display Christ's power. The Sabbath day is when Jesus did his miracles, and do you think it's different today? Do you realize that most of his heavenly works when he was on earth were done on the Sabbath? If you want the heavenly work done in your life, do you expect it'll happen while you're at home or when you're obeying what he said to do? Do you think it's more likely to be done in a day to receive it when Christ is lavishly blessing his people with his presence? Come to church where the saints are gathered, where Christ meets. Where else would you expect the Lord to do a marvelous work? 
Pray through the rest of the week, but come to his house expecting good things to happen. And then come, come to church and assemble together every week. Twice on Sundays, once on Thursday, the master prepares a feast. People put in lots of time to prepare. And you want the Lord to say, well, do you want this, the Lord to say those who were invited were not worthy? Because that's what he will say, that he does say to those who don't come to his, to his invitations. Or will he say, you have, <clears throat> will, will he say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. You avoided the Sunday night service. You skipped Thursday night Bible study. You got out of that trap of learning more about me. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Will he say that? Or will he say, you have partaken of that which I've prepared for you, and you've grown from milk to strong meat. Well done. Chances are you're a Sabbath breaker. Most of us are or have been because that's what we've been taught. And forgiveness is for the one who confesses and forsakes his sin. But there's no portion of forgiveness for the one who doesn't confess and forsake their sin. But it's not you alone. It's Mr. Study Bible and everybody else who's told you for the last, your entire lifetime, that you don't really need to obey the fourth commandment. I'm telling you that you do. It has not changed. It was written by God's own finger. It is not only a sign, it is a command. It was worthy of the death penalty in Moses' time, and there's nothing in the New Testament that changed it, but Christ nailed it to the to the. Uh, in place, never to be removed until the end of time. And I found that the wheat, those that are called by God, will endure chastening and they'll let and they'll make changes in their life. But the tares and the chaff, they'll sit and listen to a sermon and it won't change them. They've closed their ears. They refuse to change. So which one will you be? Will you be those that say, that walk in the old ways or those who say we will not walk in it? Matthew 5, 19. Therefore, whoever shall break one of the least of these commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. In Exodus 20, verse 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the sab Sabbath day and hallowed it. So go, go home and show God whether you'll be obedient to his command or not. He's watching to see who responds, and he gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey him. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that's like a hammer that breaks rock in pieces because sometimes we need that hammer to break in pieces the rock that's been formed around our hearts. Would you please forgive us, everyone who has a repentant heart, for not honoring all ten of your commandments, for nullifying the fourth, for doing our own pleasure on your day, for calling it a burden, an inconvenience, for doing our own desires instead of your pleasure. Lord, we want to walk in your way. We want the blessing and benefit that does come with obedience. And so we, everyone who's repented is choosing right now, we're choosing in our hearts that we will do our best. Lead us and guide us. We might get our foot off of the path by a step, but Lord, chasten us quickly and so we could get our foot back on the right path. Help us to walk in your ways. Seal your word to our hearts. And we thank you and praise you in Christ's name, amen.